I'd like to welcome everybody to this lovely conversation that's ahead with Anna Louise Milne, who is Director of Research at the University of London Institute in Paris. And Anna Louise writes across fiction and activism and academic criticism in both English and French, drawing upon her interests in literary studies and anthropology, migration and urban studies and translation. This beautiful cahier that we're gathered here to talk about, a general practice draws from those interests, speaking to and from them, and also urges us, I think, to consider reticence as a vital and important form of communication. The CAE is set in a general practice, a medical center, somewhere around the Gare du Nord in Paris, a place of meeting and care, a place of dialogue and conversation, peopled by a doctor and her patients, a cleaner and helper and long-term friend. And yes, it's a place of exchange, but it's also a place of silences and occlusions. And it's a place of diagnosis, and I think to a form of gnosis. So it's going to be the most lovely treat for us all to hear Anna Louise talk about this beautiful work and for all of us to have a conversation around it and into it. And before I invite her to do that and open with a reading and a few words, I'm going to ask her publisher and editor, Dan Gunn, whose CAE series this is, of which a general practice is number 37 of a wonderful series. Uh, Dan, just to give us a couple of words about what drew you to this work and what you think is important about it. Thank you. Thanks, Kirsty, and thanks for the introduction and uh, nice to meet you or re-meet all of you. Um, <clears throat> Most of uh, it's been a long, I think it's now 2007, 15 years that I've been editing this series that I launched with an idea of um, getting people to write about translation in slightly new, new ways. And as your program was shut down, our translation program in which Anna Louise taught, which was a master's in cultural translation, which included literal, you know, word, uh, word language translations, but other aspects as well. This university shut that down about seven or eight years ago, one of a, a really silly decision. But we've continued with the, um, with the series and I run the Center for Writers Trans and Translators that's, that sort of houses the series. And it, it's gone on somehow amazingly. Uh, and I suppose I'm always looking for new ways of thinking about translation and uh, languages and their multiplicity. And having read Anna Louise's, um, it's called a roman. I'm not sure that's quite the right, she'll tell us if that's the right word for it, or her récit or her narrative called 75, 75, it's the figures, which is the number uh, of Paris, the, the arrondissement of Paris. Um, I thought immediately, well, yeah, you're dealing with some, a lot of the issues, and since I know Anne-Louise writes so well, and would be someone I could work with, um, I guess probably a few years ago now, I asked her to think of something for the series, but she's busy and I'm busy and, I, and other people suggest things, and it took a while, but these things always take a while, nearly invariably, it's a few years somehow before something works out. And then she submitted to me uh, pretty much what you see, um, uh, and she'll talk more about its context. Um, and it just so obviously fit, fitted within our series and yet expanded its horizons because it's not, there's aspects to the cultural situation that she's describing that we certainly haven't dealt with in the series. There's an extraordinary sort of, mixing of languages that seems to be very, very real and visceral. Anyway, there was no question about me enjoying it and the quality of the stuff. I just had to somehow bring it through. And um, 
And then there is the question of the art, but maybe that's not so interesting here, but we can talk about that if you like. Uh, and that was it. And uh, um, Anne Louise is a consummate professional in the good sense. In the, often with writers, I maybe have one or two suggestions, or I think actually at one point we had to, uh, quite early on, we had to cut it quite a lot because it's the Cahiers could only be a certain length because of the physical nature of the thing. And usually people take weeks or months to do such cutting and, and Louise came back a day or two later with it perfectly edited. So it's, it was very easy. All, all the technical stuff that can sometimes be quite tricky um, and sometimes involve a certain amount of sort of ego bruising. I, I, I don't think either of us, I hope, felt bruised and the technical stuff was very easy. So it's definitely been one of the easiest cahiers I've ever produced, uh, especially on the on the textural side. The paintings were more complicated, but again, more for a technical reason. So I'm very proud of it and uh, happy to be with you here. And I'm happy to obviously take any questions about anything. Thanks. Thanks, Dan. And now, Anna Louise, please take the floor. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you so much, everybody, for being here. And thank you, Kirsty, and thank you, Gail, for all of the organizing, for the reading, for the enthusiasm and the incredibly rewarding comments that we've managed already to exchange by email. It's been such a, a, a wonderful experience to, to be kind of already in dialogue with you through, through those exchanges. And thanks to Dan as well for kind of making this all happen, uh, for the invitation to contribute to the Kai series, for the encouragement over the years, not just in the context of some of the shared teaching work that we've done, but also just generally as a writer. And I suppose there are two things that I want to add just before I do a little bit of reading and we get to the actual text. It's just to add, first of all, I think it's, I think what, what's been said about reticence and about this space that's a, a space, I think, yes, of sharing but also of holding back of silence, as well as the kind of proffering of, of words, the difficult proffering of words in, in all directions. Um, but I think also it's very much a space of waiting. Um, and, and this book is, uh, um, no, this, this, this Kai is a, is, a, is a book, I think, about, about waiting, about a condition of waiting. And, um, and, a, and that condition of waiting is a, is a much broader, multifaceted condition in the spaces that I've spent a lot of time in. Um, and that's one of the things that I'm, I'm very interested in. What is a, a life of waiting um, and for what, and, and who is kind of confronted with that, with that, that the complexity of that life of waiting. And, um, uh, and so, so, you know, Dan's saying, you know, sometimes we have to wait for work to find its form. And I think that's also interesting is kind of like bringing our own experiences of waiting for the moment, for the opportunity, for the for the for the writing to kind of find its own internal impetus, um, and and sometimes you know that that can be a long process. Um, and how does that sort of waiting, waiting for the work to happen, kind of speak to this other waiting, which might be more sort of you know sort of conditioned by the structures of the world that we find ourselves in? So the kind of you know the availability of opportunities to work, of opportunities to live, of opportunities to, to engage and learn languages and have mobility within the world, um, which is the, I think, kind of more characteristic, let's say, of some of the people that this, this work is about and that my life uh, materially is very, is very surrounded by. So that's one thing, this kind of idea of waiting and these different modalities of waiting and what sort of possible kind of connections might there be between them. The other thing that I think I, I, I need to add here is that this is a this was an opportunity for me to kind of take a sidestep away from a longer work in French. So this is a kind of one section of a longer book that's written first in French. And, um, and so most of the writing that I've done that's been outside of the frame of a more kind of let, let me say a kind of it's it, that's that's kind of both closer to me and that's more conditioned by a process of waiting that's less oriented towards um, its reception in the world that doesn't necessarily know as clearly how it will be received in the world or have a kind of end game um, in terms of publication in terms of kind of yeah set of career structured expectations for me that work has happened primarily in French. And I've considered my work in French, which does have now a worldly existence. But when I started writing more systematically, more seriously, and giving time to that process, 
I, I, it wasn't with that sort of imagination. I'm an Anglophone. I grew up in Scotland. It's a it's a delight for me to be back in a Scottish environment, even though I'm speaking from an office in in France. Um, and it's uh, and and so the idea of kind of writing in that way in French was always experimental, and um and 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 in a kind of reflexive circuit with myself around a relationship to reading, to speaking in French, to to teaching in French at times as well. But um, but but yeah. So this so this is yes, as I say, a long a part part of a uh, is drawn from a longer work that's written very self consciously as a novel in French. Um, and Dan's encouragement offered me the opportunity to to step back from some of that density, difficulty, and and to and to produce something in in English. And that was a very very interesting process. So perhaps that's something more that we can talk about. But I think that's enough by kind of way of just situating some of the some of the background a little bit for, for myself. Perhaps what I'll do now is just read the opening couple of pages and then we can start talking more, more kind of, you know, in a in a convivial way. Um, so, so this is just the very beginning, and this is, uh, I think, it was shared with people the PDF of these first few pages. So as you'll know, I'll just point it to it. It has this kind of, has this sort of um, well, yeah, this whole interest, I think, again, in these different sort of the different ways that writing might hold in space. Um, so I was interested in making sure that we had something like the, 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 the street name, the plaque that's on the outside of the door, but then also the just the scrawled or scribbled kind of information that that feels much more provisional, potentially kind of, yeah, that, that might be um, that might be much more fragile on the door, indicating hours of, op of, you know, opening hours and what the modalities of that are. And the fact that that's also, you know, perhaps in a multilingual um, format, um, it might in, in it might very easily in the environment that's being described here also be in Arabic, for example, or in Somali. And that's, uh, you know, so, so there's something about those different types of signage that uh, that kind of bring us towards this space where the, the, the kind of transactions, the language transactions are quite complicated. So then the actual text begins. When Hodder follows the patient back up the corridor, even if the waiting room is still heaving with pent up sighs, she begins to exhale. It starts in the top of the throat, sinks towards her chest as she measures her steps, keeping behind the questions, the relief perhaps, that are the patients alone once more, then lodges with a little hiccup. The patient disappears from view, the door on the street swings shut again, she turns the latch, as she crosses back over the greasy floor of the big square waiting room, she counts the number of people dotted around the walls, sometimes five, sometimes more. The number tells her how much longer she has to go, a final length holding that breath before she does like the patient and slips from the small step above the pavement into the stream of the street. He's already in traveling up the boulevard, carried across the road, attuning his senses again to the world as it comes at him from all directions after the hours spent in waiting somnolence behind the big, milky window. Hoda has to hold out a little longer. She pushes back up the corridor, avoiding the gaze of the six patients ensconced in the metal seats gaping around the walls like open scallop shells. Before she sits down, she runs her hand under the thin column of water from the tap, reaches for a towel, recenters the keyboard on the desk. When she looks up, the next consultation is already there. Her eyes meet the fissures in the paint, the shelves overflowing with medical supplies, the examination table. The man is standing awkwardly before her, one hand resting on the back of the chair. Asseyez-vous, sit down, she says. He removes his jacket folds it carefully, drapes it over the back of the chair. He has never consulted with her before, but that much she is sure. She reaches into the drawer for a new filing card, places it on the desk between them, a small white rectangle that gives a frame to what must follow. Hoda has always used reference cards, even before she set up in her own practice. practice. She doesn't imagine she'll change. Every card is indexed by name, date, time. She has never deviated, even when she was only shadowing for Dr. Berger in that clinic of his, shrouded in the fog of her arrival in this city, administering electrocardiograms 
applying the same senses to a constant turnover of bodies, barely registering more than the square of flesh where she taped the electrical ear into place, then noting her observations in tiny fragments that she attached regardless with a paperclip like a small flag to the notes Berger scrawled, scrawled across in arabesques across whole pages. There were files piled up all over Berger's surgery, thick brown files for all of his patients, a whole room of them. My business is keeping people alive. You see that, he said. He was the extravagant type, especially at the beginning when she was at his mercy with his hair curling down over the collar of the white coat he wore buttoned tightly over his barrel chest. C'est une sculpture de patient voiture, he added, spinning round towards her as he showed her the different examination rooms on that first day. What she had seen were files rammed into cupboards, hung in cabinets, piled on trays. He never read her notes, or at least not in front of her. When she placed the file in front of him as she accompanied the patient into his room, he would turn straight away to the printed results, then shaking his wrists to loosen the cuffs of his shirt, take up the same posture to address the patient, always the same posture, his hands clasped in front of his face, and she would slip away back to her monitors. She pulls the chair forward, looks up at the man in front of her. He is perched on the edge of the chair, holding himself very upright. English, yes, she asks. He nods. Tell me. She sees the swell of so many sleepless nights rise on his face, breaking on the hard, high bone of his forehead, washing the words he can't get out back into the swill of his eyes. He reaches towards his chest, his mouth opening silently. It hurt here, just here, she asks, pointing to her own rib cage, to the lower left ribs, moving upwards, tracking his pain in her gestures. He shakes his head, still wordless, groping further around his torso, up his back, into his armpit, his forearm tensing like a brace across his chest. And then he folds, falling forward, his hands reaching for the desk, head bowed, rising and falling with each breath as if stalled, his hair hanging like two crescent moons between his outstretched arms. Hodder waits, then pushes the white rectangle of the card towards him, taps on it with her pen. We start here, okay? She lets a moment pass, watching the silent dialogue between the two locks of hair. His breathing steadies. She looks down at the card, like an offering between them. Her method, the same questions to every patient on the first consult consultation. Chiseling in, name, date of birth, country, how long in France. A red viral line, then blue for the indications. Always the same format, the same white rectangle placed on the desk between them. The man straightens, pushes his hair back. She smiles briefly. Okay, Savali, we start. Her hand rises, holding the pen in readiness for the shards that will spill out, allowing them first to take their place in the space between her pen and the card, noting the necessary. She has learned to wait, patient as the litany of the first consultation gets underway. Then, the red line, and she can start the auscultation. At the end, she'll place the card face down on the pile. That's her rule to never come back on a card. Always go to the end of the report, then turn the card over. Sometimes she's still writing when the next patient enters. Her eyes flick towards the day's pile, the measure of the hours in the still air of this room, neither bigger nor smaller than any other day then back to the man in front of her. Address? He takes out some papers from the file he is holding on his knee, pushes them across the desk, a paycheck, a business card, his residency permit. She copies his surname, first name, address, glances at the phone on the desk, 1813. She notes the time. The pay slip declares 80 hours in the month. No way of knowing how many more he has really worked, nor where he sleeps or if this address corresponds to a place where sleep is possible. She points to the card. This is your record, okay? It stays here, she adds, 
gesturing at the wall of files behind her, behind her. I keep it for you, okay? So you tell me, what brings you here? Thank you so much, that was beautiful. And we're all going to pile in. This is not going to be a managed Q&A session at all. But if I can just um, greedily come in with a response, Anna Louise, by which to start the conversation. Mm. That card is an offering between them. This mm. beautiful moment of um, exchange and tentativeness. And you've spoken beautifully at the beginning about this idea of waiting, the theme of that kind of timelessness. The center itself occupies a place of timelessness in the midst of the stream and rush and heave of the Paris that's outside the window. And it's also, as that offering suggests, a place of ritual, as you also gave us in your reading, the holding of the hands under the column of water, the wiping of the towel, even the use of breath and so on to measure the minutes, the seconds. And then a place too of writing, mm -hmm. as the card shows us, and as the walls lined with their files of histories describe. Did this work begin for you with an understanding, a sense of that room, or did it begin with the people who occupy the room, or both? Mm, interesting. I think it. I think that the the room, that space, that idea of some sort of containment, and then, but then, that's inseparable from the idea of the intimacy of that encounter. I think so. There's something I do find like so extraordinary about that idea of this woman and this person, man, woman, who enters, who's going to offer up um, so much, I think, of fear, of perhaps expectation, perhaps also anger. Um, the doctor is going to have to receive that, but is receiving it in such a, with such regularity that the kind of, the, the, the kind of containing of that is, is very self-conscious. And, um, but yes, uh, nonetheless, there is that moment, perhaps because of just having read it again, that image of the pen sort of hovering above the cards and the sort of smallness of that opening that's there that might be some sort of figuring of the very small window of passage between these people that's, uh, but that I think is, is really quite extraordinarily intimate nonetheless. And um, so, yeah, I think it's the room, but it's two people in that room. And, um, and then there's the much broader sense as well of wanting to think about the, what it is to see people who are so often um, sort of invisibilized to use that, like a, a verb that I don't particularly like as a verb, but who are so often kind of held in spaces of neglect. Okay, perhaps that's a better way of saying, or, or, or seen poorly, or seen too quickly, or, or, or too judgmentally. So there's something as well about that kind of, what it means to almost to kind of wash the gaze as she washes the hands in order to see differently. So I think that, yeah, I think that's a, that was part of the exercise as well for me, was really thinking about, and that's and that there's something that's very that that's a, a, a much broader, longer um, sort of preoccupation is how to is how to bring to some sort of represented form uh, so much of the experience that I, I feel I have on a daily basis in the streets of the city. How to how to get that right in some way? How to how to find ways of making of of, of saying and telling some of that experience. Can I, can I ask a, a quick question? Um, I was taken by lots of different things in, in, in the pamphlet and I, let me just say straight away, I enjoyed it so much, uh, as you all know from the, you know, from, from my writing about it. But I wondered, um, at the back of my mind, I, I have a fascination of ritual mm -hmm. and, and, and there's so much description of the things that happen you know, which are ritualistic in some ways. Um, and I half thought, on the one hand, the descriptions allow you to linger over each intimate little bit of object you see or behavior 
you slow everything down with all those commas that you've got, of course. And so the sentences are really long and you have these slow commas that slow it, you know, that, that slow it down even more. Um, I, and then I wondered, is, is there something about passing over things too quickly? You know, that, that you need, in, in some ways, the poetics or the aesthetics of this general practice is to slow every little thing down so that then it becomes, you know, it, you make material, if you like, that particular person in front of you or that thing in front of you. I mean, that's how you inhabit space anyway with rituals. You, if you have to perform it, yeah. you can't instantly just get it. Yeah, no, that's really interesting. And thank you so much for drawing attention to that idea of ritual, because I think it's, I mean, absolutely. And the, there's also a fascination with the concept of practice here. Um, so I live, that's a that's a sort of it felt like a really nice kind of happenstance dimension of the English idiom and and I and I and it was an, an immense joy for me to kind of work with the English idiom which I do have a very different relationship to obviously than to working in French so the so the idea of the general practice and then thinking about what what I mean by by practice here or how that kind of how taking that sit setting of the GP um, surgery can can help me think more and, and, and give density to that idea of practice. So ritual practice, I see those as kind of, yes, in, in relation to one another and as perhaps something that's more, more self-conscious about the ritualizing of practice, which is definitely the case here. But what I, I'm also tempted to respond to your, to, to your remarks by saying that a doctor is also working through, working with a really kind of clear sense that mm -hmm. she's maybe got 15 minutes for each patient. 15, 20 minutes maximum. So one of the things that I was really kind of interested in doing was giving that sense as well of the rhythm of sections of the day. So while it is about giving time and slowing things down and the writing has that sort of ponderousness to it, I think it also knows that it can't extend that endlessly. Mm -hmm. And so in that respect, I would bring that to what was also just really a great aspect of working with Dan on this is it, was, it wasn't massively longer than it is in the final version, but it was a bit longer. And it was really interesting for me to kind of see that it could get pared down and that it could actually move faster over this slowness of the encounters. And I think that's perhaps where something again about this, you know, this, yeah, the sort of, the, yeah, what, the, what the sort of experience of time is through the writing mm -hmm. and what the experience of time in the world might be that actually, you know, it is both this kind of like, opening up of something like duration but at the same time knows that it's 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 got a you know there's necessarily a point where the door has to get shut and there is an end to the consultation to that extent and dan you might come in here um the format of the Kaye series themselves prescribe a kind of time zone don't they because one can't imagine before one sets off anything that's going to be too long. So there's all, already a sense of a time signature and a sense of, you know, ending when, when, you, when you step off. Because I don't know how prescriptive you are, Dan, but when I see all of the Kayes lined up on the bookshelf, they all seem to me to be identically, you know, sized in terms of page numbers. And that also has some kind of influence um, on how we go about making them. But Anna Louise, I was also fascinated by how you talked about this business of, of making a piece of work and there being the time that goes into making it and the time around um, considering its reception. Um, and then you described your moving into the translation process as a sort of relief, if I, I mean, that's the word I've written down on my notes, that, there, that it felt like a, this delicious other sort of thing to do, to make it into English, which is to inhabit the writing in a, on a different kind of time zone again, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, it was, I think it's, it was just sort of, um, um, it, it had it, this, this because I think, yeah, there is something quite prescriptive about the length of it. Um, and it was that sort of, getting the kind of density of that, of everything that I'd invested in a longer form in that particular space and in those characters. So there are far more characters in the longer French version. So bringing it down to try nonetheless to keep something of the relational dynamic between the two women um, who, shared, who share a kind of a dependency across their 
different sort of social situations. And I wanted that idea of them as both associates, uh, as kind of like in some ways their trajectories through the world kind of require that they don't, that their paths don't meet easily. So they have this crossover point in the surgery. And yet there's still something that at the end when they walk out together, that idea of a shared kind of a shared life and really kind of like taking the measure of that idea that over you know lots of years of working as women both displaced in their for their own reasons and their own historical backgrounds that they that is the, the fabric of their life that is part of the work is that they've done that together so that really mattered to me but being able to kind of do that without the kind of apparatus of a larger novelistic form. So in that sense, I suppose there's something a bit analogous about bringing it down, bringing it into English, which is the same sort of condensing of our consultation that can only have a certain length of time that is going to take its written form on the index card. And I think it is to do with that very beautiful, recognizable form of the Cahiers that, that, you know, that Dan has, has created and, and, and allowed to kind of um, take so many, kind of go in so many different directions. There is something that was analogous for me between that and the index card. So the index card is something that figures in the novel. It's as, it's as important as a mechanism in the novel. And perhaps in some respects, it has more of a narrative role in the novel version than it does in this one, but, it, but it's some, um, but 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 that being said, the index card becomes much more material in this version because the Kayu was going to let me do that. And so that's why that was another thing that was quite clear to me from the from the outset as I wanted that card form. I wanted to see that the writing would really go to that point whereby all that Hodder keeps is these tiny little notations that are also kind of punctuated in a in her to the rhythm of her way of taking annotations. And um, yeah, so so uh, so uh, I, I'm not sure if it's a question of relief, as just kind of um, something about uh, um, yes, it's, it's to, but uh, but a, con a containing, let's say again, and there's maybe something that's very that's really rewarding about feeling that. Yeah, that sense that you already have your materials in hand, mm -hmm. and now it's a case of just managing them and bringing them to that next place. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, yeah since uh, Kirsty the. The Kai series I started not alone, but with uh, the Sylf editions in London, partly to commemorate things that happened at the university, <clears throat> but partly also quite self consciously back in 2006 or seven as a sort of anti -dig digital move. Um, and digital wasn't nearly as omnipresent then as it is now. And so we've we, even though we have to exchange drafts on, um, I don't suppose they design it in, they design it in InDesign, I think, but in PDFs, that we, we've been really careful to try and minimize the sharing of PDFs. So we have to do a bit of it, and I'm quite happy people will see, see some bits of it, because we want it to be a physical object that people hold in their hands. It has a quite nice smell when it comes out of the box, and it has this visual dimension which uh, rarely works as well. Sometimes it works slightly better actually on the screen than on in on the page for sort of a, for reasons to do with light and color. But it, we, when we're designing them, we're definitely not designing them with an eye with an eye to the screen. We're designing them with an eye to paper. So if that was the is at the outset, then I suppose the question you ask about length, of course I can it's not cheating really, but I can vary the length of the text because um, even though it, it has its own requirements in terms of layout, the, the images can be more or fewer or more numerous. And actually, they're ne they are nearly all the same page length, but what, they can't go any longer, but one or two are a bit shorter. So there is some flexibility. But I, I think of that also as a being a bit, um, if not maybe in defiance of the digital, at least as a, if, if, ideally uh, experienced as a sort of antidote to the digital in that, as, as I imagine we all know here present, when we're asked to write something for some sort of digital platform online, um, I'm often quite often asked to do something for the university to explain something. I know I can go on for longer or shorter and there will always be space for it. I can witter on for pages and pages and you know, if someone has the energy, they might say, cut it down. But usually they'll just go, fine, 
it's digital, we can publish as much as we want. And so again, this is a sort of, I want it to be the opposite of that. So in that sense, I mean, maybe in Paris, we have our, it's not an Ulipian, it's not Ulipo exactly, because it's a very obvious constraint, but there is something of that constraint, which I think most people have found a help rather than a hindrance. And I hope so, and I hope that's the case. I, I, did, I wanted to um, just pitch in with a couple of comments. Um, I, they're not, strongly related, um, but um, the first is that it seemed to me that the room, that the, the waiting room, the doctor's surgery um, was, is shabby, but I'm not sure that appears anywhere directly in your description. So this is really just a, it, it's just really a, a question. Somehow, even though you don't say it, the impression I came away with was that it was a slightly shabby kind of well-worn um, kind of doctor's waiting room. And I, I just thought that was interesting that I should come away with that impression, even though, you know, I, it, it, it maybe was conveyed in, in very subtle ways or something. So, so anyway, the question is, is it shabby or is it like a brand spanking new, you know, um, uh, kind of all bells and whistles kind of waiting room? Yeah, I mean, that's really interesting. Yeah, I, I mean, it's definitely shabby. Um, you're absolutely right. I think that, you know, just in the bit I read, you know, the sort of greasy floor, um, I think there probably are bits that suggest it's pretty well worn, right? And that there's, you know, and then also there's the whole thing about the cleaning of it and, and the bits of kind of, you know, it's not, there's no attention in any case to 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 make it a space of, of kind of, you know, that produces a sort of a reaction of repugnance or of distress. So I know it's perfectly, you know, it's, it's a perfectly acceptable space to sit in. It's cleaned every day in my imagination, but it's a space where people will abandon a free newspaper or a coffee cup. And so if you get there at sort of four o'clock in the afternoon, there's going to be that kind of waiting room waste around you. Um, I think the other thing that's important about it, which I think, I, I think even in the beginning of this, in the English shorter English version comes through, is that it's a it's a space that does open directly onto the street. So kind of communicating that was really important to me. That idea that from the start, this idea that you step straight into the street from this space, and that there's something about I can't remember exactly where it's described, but there's a sort of idea of the window as a kind of as a porous frontier onto the street. And so it's got that kind of one way glass or kind of like, you know, the, the milky window is that kind of, you know, the, the partly a, opaque glass that gives onto the street that you can kind of see bodies through. And there's a sense that there's something behind that. But I've always found that really fascinating um, that you kind of, you know, in a busy urban space where a lot of the windows are given over to commercial kind of, you know, sort of, a sort of incitations to go in and look and see and it kind of creates this, this very, um, a transition between the street and, and there's something that's more of an interruption in this case, like walking into a waiting room, you walk into a space and you're like, Oh, uh, you know, suddenly everything changes that the feel of the space, the way the bodies are in the space, the, the fact that there's no noise in that space, particularly or very minimal conversations are taking place. So so you suddenly kind of step into something that I imagined and that I wanted to give a feeling for is kind of almost like stepping into a pool. So it's like a, a kind of full body transformation in the same way that if you step into water, everything feels different. The coldness, you're, you know, there's a sort of um, there's a, so, so that was, so yes, I, it, it's definitely, um, it's definitely has, has a particular atmosphere to it. And I probably don't use the word shabby. I'm not sure I would have used the word shabby about it, but it's, but it has a very kind of like, uh, it's a, it's a definite, um, yeah, it definitely kind of solicits the senses in that way. Could, could I just add something there? Um, Kirsty, you mentioned it's near, uh, you, one imagines it is near Gare du Nord. It's a bit different, the Cartier, uh, and it's indicated there pretty explicitly by Rue de la Chapelle. Um, so it's a street that is so busy and um, I, I don't know, I, I know you don't much better than me, but we'll describe it, but I've lived not so far away. 
um, it's not an area where one would be likely to find, it's not a street, like, again, correct me if I'm wrong, Anna Louise, it's not a street where you'd be likely to find a super posh waiting room to a super posh doctor's. Um, they tend to be elsewhere. And the street is really quite lively and frenetic. Um, so that sense, I mean, you convey it, but anyone who knows Paris well will feel that, wow, that's busy, 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 and lots of different languages, nationalities are going on all around you, and people in distress. Um, are all around, not maybe all around you, but they're certainly present and visible. So it's it's uh, it's not a not as I don't think it's an well you speak it better better than me, but it's not an an easy or relaxed space. We're we're a long way from where Anna Louise is working. Let's put it that way, and where I work as well, which is the seventh arrondissement, which is super the wealthiest part of the whole of France, I believe. So um, it's a it's a very different type of area that we're dealing with here. I wonder if we might bring in Ian and Bernadette at this point, who've both worked in medical contexts. When you talked about the pool, Anna Louise, I'm also minded of a theatre, you know, because there's that rush outside the door, which is life. And then there's that beautiful stilling down of time that you talked about in the opening and all of the gestural stuff that goes on. That seems quite repetitive at times, the pointing with the pen and the pointing to the self and these kinds of exchange, bodily exchanges of information. Um, this ritual space, Bernadette and Ian, is this all, when you read the Kaye, is this all familiar territory to you, this sense of some kind of formal transaction? Yes, uh, it's very familiar, sorry. Yeah, and that, and that merging imperceptibly between the public and the private is, is, is a theme in, in your writing. So, you know, the physical level, as you've just been saying, from that street into this intimate space contained by these white cars, but also between them, you know, they are interdependent and, and you know, from the duties, from the clean, the arrangement of the cards, but also um, Ollie helped the doctor chair. You know, she collected the children from school. She enabled her to do her work. In so I thought it was such a lovely melange and private, which just see in your writing. Um, looking, you, you say somewhere the strange complexity of the modality of looking, but it's looking in all senses, not just with the eyes, but with all aspects of eyes. Um, but from a female um, entwinement in the looking and the count of duties. Um, yeah. That female looking at those finding of that public. Does that make sense? Um, absolutely. It's kind of slightly breaking up for me. I'm not sure if the connection oh, is on there. No, no, I mean, it's absolutely fine. What I'm hearing is the, the, the female looking, and then that, yeah, I mean, I'm, and I'm so, it's so um, rewarding to me to feel that that kind of idea of the, of this unstatedness between these two women and all that they've shared of the sort of dependency around the children and the kind of like what it is as well to kind of share your children in that respect when you need to to do the work was, is this definitely something that I I find really really um interesting and still very it's still something that I'm thinking a lot about so it was I wanted that to to be there but to be there with that kind of latent uh, complex sort of understatement. So perhaps that's also where the question of reticence comes in, of how much can these two women kind of actually look at one another? I think there's a there's an important part um, towards the end where they do look at one another and they've done so much looking at others, looking for children, looking out, making sure that they're safe in the, in the street. Um, I think Ollie does a lot of looking as well in that surgery environment, even if she's not herself the doctor, she's done a lot of looking at the doctor, looking at patients, she's done the looking at the records. So they've kind of, they've, they've alongside one another, they've done that very careful kind of measuring of what's happening and the, all those small gestures that say so much about whether a child is well, happy and how you have to feel of all of those things yeah. in the same way that so much of what Hodder's doing is looking at those small things in order to get a starting point with her patients. 
and she's and she's recording them because she's seeing them again and again in order to kind of build up a kind of repertoire that she can draw on in order to confront some I think some of these you know really extraordinarily difficult situations of people who you know who who, who, are, who are confronted with such terrible kind of um, physical lives, um, whether it be because of the working environments that they're in or the, the, the living environments that they're in, but penalized so terribly by their, their own kind of, you know, possibilities in the world. Um, and the, uh, yeah, so, so that, but, and so those two women who are doing this very careful looking and whose worlds depend on that careful looking, look at one another is the, I think perhaps the thing that, that's the, that, um, that they allow themselves, but they, they'll only allow themselves that very briefly, I think. And it comes back to what Kirsty was saying at the beginning about reticence. And the way at the end, they look the same too. We can't yeah. tell who is who. Yeah. And they see things in the same way. They both see the chairs as empty shells at the edge of the wall clinging. And they see the information and the cards in similar terms. So all of these beautiful kind of melding mm. selves. Yeah. And I, I love the way there was a description of one point where somebody came and made out like they hadn't, but the doctor saw that they'd been before. Mm. It's the subtleties that, you know, as a clinician myself, you, you register, uh, but translating those in a subtle way into writing on the page um, is a challenge, um, but one you mastered wonderfully. Yeah. <laughs> But again, that, that you know what you can get in looking and trying to translate that um, into words on the page is something I'm wrangling with. Um, yeah, so very inspiring for me. Uh, <laughs> I think a difference for me is I work with families which are big and noisy and hectic, yeah. um, and of course there are moments of quiet and, and reticence and intimacy. Um, but it, it, your white cards and your individual kind of consultations were, were quite different in some ways. Mm -hmm. Right, interesting, yeah. 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 And one of the things that I did that just was, I hadn't actually made that connection, but listening to you one, uh, a few years ago now, I did, a, I did a diploma at the University in Paris on psychosocial healthcare. And, um, and it was uh, it's on transcultural competencies was what it was called it had a beautiful name actually when I think about it you know a diploma in transcultural competencies in a psychosocial environment and so and I was given the job of assisting um, with family-based consultations in multilingual environments and it had a similar kind of structure to what I grew up with because I grew up with my mum very involved in the children's panel in Scotland and um and so and so the children's panel was out for me as a teenager was kind of, kind of led to hold this as a kind of hugely innovative space where not only the, the, the kind of, you know, the, mag the equivalent of the magistrate, but also social workers and teachers and family members would gather together to discuss situations um, that related to fragilities for children and, the, um, and potential, you know, care related issues. And this was something similar in, um, in, in the French context. So there would be social workers, there would be doctors, there would be um, so, um, you know, psychologists, teachers, and the family members. And I took the notes. So, and, they, and there was often a multilingual dimension to this. And so I was invited to tr transcribe the languages that I didn't understand as well. So for a year, every Thursday morning, I cycled all the way up to Anières and I sat in this room and scribbled these notes <laughs> like as, the, as the conversation went all over the place. And um, so now, now that I'm listening to you, I'm thinking that probably was actually quite an important in terms of for myself, you know, then I had to type them up and I had to make sure that was all part of my training. I had to, you know, just make the decisions about what, what I'd lost and what I'd got and, and you know, and yeah. Just... Yeah, yeah. I think that's one thing I'm trying to do in, in the work I'm doing is to capture all the things I never wrote down in words. Yeah. You know, in the notes and the files. Yeah. It's an interesting idea, isn't it? What, what isn't written down. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think it's, yeah, it's, that's really, um, that's a really interesting thing to think about again, actually. Um, yeah, I, there was one point where I really wanted to write a text about this one particular Guadeloupian boy, and um, I still have all the notes, but there is something there, yeah. Go back to that. That's sort of, yeah, the spaces where we're feeling and we're not necessarily knowing kind of what those, what was around the words that were said that we could note at the time, yeah. Mm. Stephen, right. you've got your hands up. I'm just going to let Stephen come in, and I know Ian wants to come in as well. <laughs> yeah, I, well, I know that Fiona had her hand up as well, uh, but uh, 
Uh, anyway, I, I was really taken with your description of, uh, or even your difficulty in specifying, uh, looking at unseen lives or li lives that have not been examined uh, in, in close detail. And, uh, but I'm also interested in your approach in the writing from the French perspective, because reading your work the, this afternoon, and, and particularly when you read it out loud, really reminded me of uh, Georges Perec, the Life User's Manual. And, uh, and I, I was wondering if there's something in the French that lends itself to writing about place and about these different lives in different places. Yeah. Um, oh, I don't. I, I. I. don't know if it's specific to the language or if it's um, uh, that there's for me, and maybe for. I mean, Perec was I think lacked a kind of anchor um, in his own mm. life. I mean, that's a very simplistic way of putting. But I think he. You know, if you go to that work that he did, where he he wanted to go back to the address. Of his of where he had grown up as a small child before he had to go into hiding during the war and he returned to that space for seven years in a row and there was something as in a way about kind of just going back over that ground and trying to see what what he could see differently and to see maybe that that space would give give him back some right. of the missing histories um which i you know which which um yeah which i think he did and partially reconstruct in the, that book not so much life for users manual but the memo the the souvenir d'enfance the w book the w or oh Child yeah, yeah. Memory, right where he he gradually pieces together some fragments of memory and um and so yeah so i think that probably for myself writing in french and being a you know a kind of slightly anchorless person, young person. I moved to France for the first time when I was 18. It was very much directly from Scotland to Paris. Um, and it was, you know, and it was definitely about sort of fleeing English, fleeing Scotland, fleeing all sorts of things about Scotland and English or something uh, about a, an, an, an English world at that time. And, um, and so, uh, yeah, so I think probably I did a lot of looking and a lot of describing and that so for me, the French language probably has quite a lot to do with the built environment. And um, but I, I couldn't generalize and say that that's that's a more general aspect of the French language. But I could I, I can totally feel that that kind of parentage with Perec in that respect, for sure. Thank you. Um, is there a hand raising mechanism here? Because I'm not seeing it. So I don't know if I should just body it or not. But I did want to say something. So. Can I just say one thing? Um, Fiona's told us that she has to go in the chat, and I'd love to hear from her. Fiona, if you've got a minute before you have to run off, would you like to pop your little comment in here? Sure. Yeah. Um, I, I just I put it in the chat just so that my response was there in case I didn't get the chance to to respond before I left. But um, I, I'm kind of coming from a counselling background. That's my my bread and butter, doing therapy with people, and so. One of the things I often speak about with my students is responsible note keeping. And I don't mean that as in, you know, you do it as a routine and you, you dot your I's and your, your T's. It's actually how do you do it in a way that's respectful to people? Um, and I, I really enjoyed the detail that you put into to thinking about that. And the, the, when she thinks back on the previous, their mentor or, or whoever it is she worked with previously and how it was more chaotic and, the kind of explanation for that was well my focus is on the people so the paperwork doesn't matter kind of thing but actually the paperwork is what represents people in the world is what goes forth into the world to it's what gets left behind in, in these spaces the the only thing that captures what what was exchanged between these two people and and often it's a very official document in medicine and, and can you know someone's entire life can be put down to a few lines and so the care that has to be taken to what those lines say and how they're kept and stored and maintained is is really important so I thought it was just a, a really beautiful way to to capture the care that this uh, this doctor has for the people she's working with um yeah thanks I, I'm, I'm I, that's a really lovely um I, I really appreciate that yeah and, and her being able to say I keep this record 
um, and that the care of the of the archiving really mattered to me for sure. You know, this is again a world where people, you know, all of their lives might just be in one small folder it, at best. And it's, you know, and I've, I've spent a lot of time in that sort of environment with people who are asylum seekers or just basically living in undocumented lives. And these crushed bits of paper that they pull out of pockets and fold. And that's, you know, that's their kind of passport to any help, any hope of something that's going to give them some relief in the world. And so, yeah, that idea that this this is this this card will be kept kind of almost whatever and for forever really mattered to me there's a kind of point where the doctor has this insane sense of frustration with that process as well and wants to break it all down but yeah the idea of the shared archive that sits somewhere kind of unacknowledged within the city within the kind of chaotic sets of movements and transactions and kind of managing uh, of lives that goes on around it and that's part of the stillness of it is the is the is the duration of the archive and I think that maybe is you know kind of intersects a bit with the work of Ellie if she's still here you know I, I definitely have a big interest in in archives and I think it's a uh, yeah it is some it's it's um it's wonderful what we can do with what has been kept in these sorts of ways so yeah the, the care to the paperwork feels really important. I think I I also just wanted to comment before I disappear is is um, to follow on from what Gail was saying about it, you know the, the sense that it felt like you were slowing things down in that moment. What was really interesting for me there is that that's something that's come out of research around bilingual therapists when when they work outside of their language, everything gets slowed down and the, the meaning is allowed to emerge in a totally different way. Um, so it was really nice to see those those parallels coming through. But um, thank you so much for for sharing with us today. Well, thank you, thank you so much. Yeah, no, and in response to that, with the students, I mean, we don't work on kind of my students are not kind of working towards kind of care environments at all. But one of the most extraordinary experiences I have is showing that film Shoah by Claude Lanceman, which has these long periods of testimony that are given in the, in person's first language might be Yiddish, might be Polish, might be German, and are then translated and, 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 and asking students to sit through that experience of non-comprehension around this incomprehensible scale of tragedy is a really interesting sort of experience. And I completely agree with that kind of that possibility of kind of moving towards that doesn't have to yet be sort of discursively available and the translation and um, that kind of sim, you know, successive translation allows that movement towards the moments where discursive clarity gets kind of held within the words and then moves away from us again as we look back up at the person. So yeah, I mean, you're, you're, you know, you're helping me see the connections between various bits of work. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. See you later. Um, just off the, the back of that comment, actually, the, the thing that it seemed that in the bit that you read that you focused on most was precisely on those cards. And I couldn't help but think as you're reading about the cards and writing on the cards and the history of the cards, it goes back to, the doctor's tutelage with the older doctor and all that. I couldn't help but think that um, a couple of things that you're very interested in encounters, how encounters happen. And so, you know, the doctor's surgery where, you know, someone who you've never seen before comes in and starts speaking reasonably intimate things is an obvious example of a really extreme form of encounter. And then I was thinking that like, I'm sitting here in this slightly shabby office, um, looking at a screen with sort of card sized little images of, of all the people on it, you know, and in this, this sort of thumbnail size of, of all the 11 or now I think 10 people here, which is also this, extremely kind of condensed and poignant form of encounter, you know? And I just, you know, I was thinking two things that like every encounter, A, leaves some form of trace, okay? In this case, it's the little card that 
has a history of your tutelage and gets filed somewhere and gets brought out again another time. But also um, every encounter has like, at their aspects of the encounter, which are, which are missed or lost. Either they're missed in that they never happened, you know, or sort of whole aspects of someone's life that simply don't appear in the encounter, or if they, you know, everything outside of what gets on the card, basically, um, or um, or else, um, if not missed, then lost. You know, they, they, they sort of flash briefly for a moment. Um, they don't either go on the card, or they didn't somehow figure in your your writing. You know, all the other bits that just they just disappear again. And and so encounters are extremely poignant things. And I, I mean, just to 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 say, I. I thought that the way you wrote about that encounter between a doctor and an unknown patient and sort of doing it almost entirely through that card and maybe through the floor that they walk on and that's where the shabby office comes in, I think. I thought that was really good. I, I just seemed, you know, you really kind of, you, you really captured all of what's not there about the encounter, you know, mm -hmm. it, like there's the encounter, which is a tiny little postage stamp size thing. And then there's the huge universe of everything that isn't the encounter, which could have been. And, and I thought you really somehow you captured that. I thought that was great. So, okay. um, yeah, sort of this tiny part of the world, which is just the encounter between you and your patient. So anyway. Ian, did you have a remark? Uh, I, I think we've moved on really. Before I was thinking about the uh, mutability of space in relation to all of that, of the inside, outside, outside becoming the inside. But um, you know, I'm I'm a bit in, in knots about that or with that now. You know, right. And <laughs> um, I, I suppose I, I'm I'm thinking now about the the, the later. It, it doesn't relate to what you've read, but in relation to the uh, the boy with the fractured sternum. Mm. Yeah. And I thought in some way, I know that it's not about metaphor really, but in some way that becomes a metaphor for the separation that has occurred um, in the lives of the two women. I thought, I mean, that was my initial reading of it, you know. Later, I thought differently. I, it was, but just initially, um, I, I, was, I was thinking about that and, and how they're their pursuit perhaps later pursuit of coming together again through the card system you know was an act of, of them both coming together and maybe resolving the problem which maybe has a sort of a, a, a broader sort of significance but maybe that's taking it a bit too too far my own background i i, nurse, I was a nurse in the intensive care unit for, for many many years and um, so the act of ritual and um, procedure mm -hmm. and the thinking that occurs in the negative spaces, you know, you know, in the silent spaces is very important in order to allow for the, I suppose, the, the medical um, diagnosis and mm -hmm. um, treatment to, to occur. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, anyway, so that's, you know, so. no, that's really interesting. I mean, I think, you but know, just, comments, just, you know, there really. No, well, thank you so much. I mean, I think, you know, that's absolutely like the metaphor kind of of the fracture, the fact that the fracture is a chest bone, the prowess sort of idea. I mean, yeah, it's sort of sitting on that, I hope, kind of some sort of cusp that's between the, the idea that something is broken in for, for all of these people in some way. This, if, if they're there, there's something that needs repair. And, um, and the... But it's also maybe maybe that maybe the um, maybe the it's about the process of repair though something just the very yeah. fact of being there is already some sort of process of repair and um and that so yeah um the, there's also the kind of it comes back maybe to the to what you were saying about the 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 inside outside and what the porosity is between those and then and it's just sort of responding a little bit again to that, what feels sort of quite 
visual in my head at the moment as we're speaking about this work again of just partly because of having just read that bit of the the moment where the hair the kind of locks of the hair and there's something that's happening in that dialogue between the locks of the hair as the man falls forward and you know and um and he's in kind of a state of real crisis and uh and at the same so there's and nothing's obviously being said between two locks of hair but there's a kind of containing there which is also similar to that sort of containing of pen above the above the card that's going to allow something to be sort of felt as said between that space and so it's kind of you know it's a negative space or that kind of openness that's very slight but nonetheless there um i think that that's that that is the kind of broader structure of the book and the um and the there's a kind of there's a space within the room and then there's the um where something gets said but there's something kind of completely mysterious as well about what what else is happening so we lose we don't know what happens to the young man with the broken chest bone it's it's going to remain completely kind of unsaid what happens there so if there's repair it's perhaps if i you know try and go to the end of that thought the repair is not in bringing those two bones back together again but rather perhaps in seeing that very small give that's and it's described as a step, which I think is the kind of, you know, the formal term that the doctor would do as a sort of diagnosis is feeling that. So that that idea of a step is is, a, is sort of important as well as a that might be where the metaphor really kind of like resides from my point of view, I think. Yeah. And the idea of repair as narrative itself. I wonder if we could, we've completely forgotten to ask you to read again, because we've all got so many lovely things to hear, I mean, to, to ask you about. Might you read us another section? Sorry, Gail, I interrupted you then. But should we hear from Anna Louise again next with a reading, and then you come in, Gail? Um, it no, was... you want to speak now, so you well... must. Yeah. No, I don't, I mean, in, in some ways we just want to jump up and down and say our thing because this is so exciting um, and, and, and it's, a, it's lovely to hear um, a lot of the conversation and it was just before I lose my, in my geriatric age, in my dotage, I tend to lose kind of my thread of thought but it was a way of connecting I, I mean, I, I was fascinated by ritual, of course, and I'm partially, my first degree was partially in anthropology, which is why I'm fascinated with ritual. Uh, and I'm also fascinated with ritual in, in a religious sense, because then, of course, um, Ian said procedure. Now, procedure is very different from ritual to me. Mm -hmm. um, the procedure of the surgery and all of the paraphernalia that goes on, which, which in some ways signals a, a kind of institutional power or an institutional framework of understanding. And what you get with, with ritual, I think, is that something escapes and it's to do with encounter in, in the sense that Lawrence talks about. What is a religious encounter of sorts? Something escapes that procedure, mm. that, that ritual of sorts. And, and that's the thing that I'm really fascinated with. What escapes and you know how does an encounter framed in a way that exceeds, if you like, that procedure of of the space yeah no that's really really interesting um hmm. i don't know i don't know how i think that's really fascinating i'm going to have to think a little bit more about that but i think it is the um it's, it's the idea of escaping i suppose i would want to come back to you and say how what sort of what sort of movement do you feel in that escaping uh, for well, me the idea of escaping means it's kind of it's going somewhere else. Whereas I think yeah. my feeling is that there's something that's that's kind of that's that's got a sort of a, a, a potentiality. Yeah. But, but that's quite sort of that still comes back to that idea of the containment yeah. of it, you know. So yeah. it feels more like yeah. a gas that's, if you like, yeah. would would escape, but it doesn't yeah. quite escape. Maybe. Well, tr I mean, I I hate to use the word transcend, mm. but that's quite where I'm I'm going. And I, you, Kirsty, mm. will know why I hate to use the word transcend. And all of that religious discourse that, that 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 comes of it, but it's the sense that the way you write about Hodder, um, despite the fact that she is a doctor, despite the fact that she has institutional presence, mm -hmm. despite all of that framework, the encounter isn't couched in, in those terms quite as much as you could have done, and that fascinates me as well. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I just I, sorry, Henry. No. 
Yeah, I'll just, I just very quickly respond to that. I mean, I think one of the things that actually came out of the really interesting conversation we had with some of Dan's students some uh, back now uh, in January sometime or February um, is that what they were fascinated by the fact of how different this healthcare environment felt like to, relative to the ones that they know. So it touches as well on that idea of how squeaky clean is this environment. And I think so to your transcendence, what I would want to say is that quite sort of in terms of the material conditions of the delivery of general practice, there is quite a lot of freedom I mean, it is also obviously kind of very materially constrained, but something about the ways in which doctors still today define their, the conditions of their interaction, mm -hmm. I think does allow for a certain degree of freedom. And that is something that's very interesting to me. So if I, I could make that something, you know, mm -hmm. about what it is to be a woman practicing mm -hmm. alone in this environment, the choices that underpin that, the choices which is also important here about, I think it's not as explicit in this version as it is in the French one, about the fact that she doesn't necessarily charge the same thing every time. And she allows for the fact that sometimes people can't pay, but there's a sort of trust that maybe they'll pay next time and um and so so that it's it's not transcendence in a, in a religious sense but i think it is the exercise of freedom and it, it does seem to me really important that the freedom that, that that hodder has and the freedom that ollie has is minimal for sure but it is that i think the text has something about how practice can also be the experience of freedom and um and that's uh that's 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 one of the things that yeah that i I've thought quite a bit about. Can I just say something? Um, there's, there's one sentence you write. Um, She's never doubted the importance of these cards, what it means for a patient to see the roar of symptoms become the letters and numbers. That's such a lovely phrase. So on the one hand, there is a sense of containment and being listened to and care, which is very evident, but it also hints at the impossibility of dealing with everything there is going on in these these lives you know so that's such a lovely phrase really is my comment the roar of symptoms right <laughs> but, um, my, my thought if i can just throw in a quick thought um and i don't think it's one i particularly shared with Anna louise uh because i think it's about the difference between what's being described and the fact of this as a piece of writing um and it, it came to my mind partly when lawrence used the word thumbnail size because one of the parts of the text i found so difficult is the broken thumb nail or mm -hmm. fingernail or toenail I think it is anyway it's a nail that's got sort of uh, has to come off and um, I spent a much much more in the last four years more time in hospitals or doctor surgeries than I have in the rest of my 64 years uh, my mother dying slowly in Scotland um, our child being very very sick in a children's hospital here my, my partner being sick myself being sick most of this year so I've had it up to here in a way. So working on Anna Louise's text was extremely anguishing for me. Um, I was oh, lots of painful things came back. Um, uh, so the, the sheer physical sort of, and I think what what I find so powerful about the text, and including this the the, the index card as a as a sort of uh, central trope of the text, is that the, the thing that the card can't record is pain. Um, you know, the subjective nature of it, uh, because nothing can do that. Um, as we all know, a small thing can hurt enormously, a big thing cannot hurt at all. And it's that, but, but the text records it, our text, not the cards. And, and so the, the cards aren't the text. The, Anna Louise manages to make me feel an extraordinary amount of empathy with the pain, even though those can't be notated in any way. And that's really an achievement of the writing, I think, one of the achievements. Yeah. That would be yeah. the, other, the kind of counter transcendence. But yeah. <laughs> uh, yes, I think, yeah, this idea of the, the narrative itself generates an atmosphere of care. And to go back to Bernadette's point about this the kind of intensely female paradigm. I mean, there's something almost, I know you're not wanting to use this kind of language, but there is something of the Pieta when Hoda holds the boy's foot mm -hmm. and these broken bodies that come to her and the way that the text itself um, trammels up all of the broken pieces and creates a kind of atmosphere of, car of calm and care um, in the process of our reading. Please read another little section because I can see our time is rushing on. 
I know. I feel I should. I should read the bit about the foot. I know. Well, I just don't know where it is. Um, when she holds his foot, yeah. Um, because that was a thing. Um, for me, that holding the foot. But uh, but then I'm also quite tempted to bring Ollie into it. Um, mm. Can I bring? Can I bring? Can I just make Ollie exist in it? So yeah. I'm just going to jump a little bit. Um, this uh, so that brings us back to the space as well. Ollie presses on the switch and the strip lighting leaps into life. The debris of the day is waiting, food wrappers, free newspapers, cigarette cartons. She knows it all in one glimpse and sees the sequence before her, unfolding as it does in small adjustments, pushing it ahead of her, start in the back, the bins, the desk, picking over it, separating scraps, papers to stack, clearing the space, pushing it, pushing it, all ahead of her to the edge until the black shiny surface of the desk is big enough to be wiped over, lifting in turn the big foam, the keyboard, and then the pile of cards that Hodder always leaves to one side and back through to the waiting room with the bins, the mop, the bucket, two buckets of water at least, no rain for days, but still the dirt, a wet cloth around the metal seat screwed to the wall, rubbing, leaning in, rubbing, started later than usual, not that it matters anymore, no need to rush and what with the heat of the day, she'd slept a bit, maybe 30 minutes. Not like her, but sometimes now. And what does it matter anyway? No need to rush. Hodder's long gone home, making her way up the avenue as the shops are shutting, up to her tower on the edge of the city, while she, Ollie, has winded her way through the crowds, along the boulevard, over the bridge, on her route to the crossroads, where the surgery sits in the shadow of the station. Ollie hasn't seen Hodder for weeks now. Before, it was every day when the surgery closed, their crossover, putting some words on the day, just the ones they needed, to sort it into an order so that it could start again tomorrow. The children's needs first, when Ollie still fetched them from school, fed them and watched over them while Hodder worked on. Then the patients who filed through the waiting room, for years now, and Hodder's children, long gone. Ollie hasn't seen them now, for what? months. Yes, even Jeanne, who she has her own life now, that's normal. And sometimes Hodder will say Jeanne and give her some small piece of news. But it's all the same to Ollie. And sometimes Jeanne calls her up still now, though less, her voice bursting into her ear. Ollie, ça fait longtemps. She smiles. Yes, a long time, a lifetime. And there's no need to rush. She comes and goes when she wants, slower now. Hodder doesn't care, doesn't know the bins the bins first, putting it all in order so that when Hodder comes back tomorrow, everything is ready for her, for the day. On the door to the street, there's a shadow leaning, like a big fish in the water. What does he think? Surely not that the doctor is still receiving, waiting for the bus, maybe? She'd shake him off like shaking out a sheet, but he'll be long gone when she leaves, pushing the broom under the chair as she muses, cans, plastic wrappers, phone cards, once a shoe, plastic bags, she never looks, only if it's papers, a file with papers for a whole family. She'd called the number, but it's still in the cupboard. Weeks now, might as well throw it out, but you never know. People against the glass, like a washing machine, throwing the world around in the big white rectangle of the window, all bunched together in the soapy light. Then a head, a shoulder, the sound of a voice, not even words, soaked, sloshing right there on the other side of the glass, then gone, spinning, tossing, the groan of the bus, ding, ding, and a child crying, pushing the mop in front of her. The man has moved off from the door, long arcs swishing as she steps backwards like a clock ticking, and she knows exactly how long, like the minutes follow her arms, pushing it all ahead of her. No need to look when she puts her jacket back on, her phone in the pocket, because she knows already, to the minute. Slower now, though, no need to rush. What difference does it make? The empty shells of the chairs stuck along the wall like open mouths. A newspaper rolled into the metal underneath, leaning in, pulling the bins by the door, then the bucket in the cupboard. Could I just say, Anna Louise? I think I mean this is this is fantastic work. I mean it's 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 wonderful, and I, I look forward very much to uh, reading more. Um, what you were saying about modalities of waiting, 
and the way that affects uh, a piece of writing. I, I was absolutely fascinated by that. And also what Dan was saying about the way in which constraints could be creative. I mean, it's interesting also thinking about the way in which um, in the published form, there are illustrations, but I mean, there may not have been, or there may have been different ones. Also the fact that it's part of, or it's taken from a longer uh, novel in, uh, in, a, in a different language. It, it just makes me think about the fluidity of the piece of work and how many forms it can exist in and how many states it can exist in, you know, while it's waiting before it appears, after it's appeared, when you go back and revise it, all sorts of things. So, the, I mean, lots in what you're saying, lots to think about. So thank you for that. Yeah. yeah. That's really, really interesting. I mean, there's for sure, there's a, I mean, this conversation as well, that feels like, you know, this idea that we could like turn it around and maybe, yeah, we, each time it gains some sort of new, new kind of, yeah, uh, a new rendition in some way. That feels like a really, a really lovely thought. Um, thank you. I mean, I, um, I like, yeah, the sloshing around of it. <laughs> it's sort yeah. of, so um, j just thinking about the index cards again, um, it, it would be fascinating um, to see the impact if the index cards were doubled in size or halved in size. In you know, or if they had lines or if they were blank. Dif different index cards do very different things. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. No, I mean, I think that, you know, I have to say, you know, all, all gratitude to the designers of the book and to Dan for supporting me in it. It wasn't obvious that we were going to get that, but I think they, I think they do what they, what I wanted them to do, which is sort of, is, is offer the space as well to imagine what I think we we, we know, perhaps the next generation of, of readers won't know, but we know something about what those cards are and, um, and what it is to hold writing on a particular size of paper and what it is to kind of shape our writing to the, the materials that we're using. And, um, and while I, 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 I don't, I wouldn't want particularly to kind of like draw a, a, a rigid differentiation between my writing that might be for an online environment or, a, you know, a kind of digital environment and a material environment. I think we're always, you know, we, we, sh we change our typefaces online. We choose how we kind of like situate things on the page, even if it's going to be in a digital environment. And, and that, that sort of, it, it, it's so, it's so much part of, I think, of what we're doing when we're producing our meaning. So the space of the text, the, the spaces that we're interested in, I think that is, is going as well towards some of the ways in which you're, as a, as a group of people, thinking around imagined spaces as well. And I feel that's, you know, the essaying that we might do in that. Anna Louise, thank you so very much for what's been the most delicious and illuminating and comforting time in your presence and to hear you read your beautiful text and to talk about these ideas which are complex and human and take us to a place where we remember that writing has a presence far beyond the simple transcription of, of an idea or an event and to thank you for your generosity of your time I know that Gail has to leave so she can now finish the recorded part of this discussion, but I also feel that we've prevailed upon you long enough in the chair, and we hope that we can maybe pick up these conversations and continue them, because as we talked about, the idea of a kind of reinvention of text in our discussions that come from it, what a heavenly idea that is. Yeah, well, and it's been a total delight. Thank you so much. Thank you so much great. for your questions well, and your reading and the interest. It's been absolutely, it's been a, a total joy for me to, to, to spend time with you and with you through this text. So thank you.